To the viewers and seekers of the truth, we welcome you all to our program, Prepare to Meet the God. This is a program set out for one single purpose, to give free course for the light of the gospel, to give its divine interpretation through the scriptures of God alone. And in that way, we may be able to prepare ourselves correctly of how we should be religiously living as we await the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My brethren, this is the eighth episode of the Image of the Beast series, where we will understand the very goal of this Mark of the Beast, and that is to have people worship the Beast and to submit to the homage of the first day of the week, Sunday to say, as the holy day of the Lord outside of the Bible's declaration. There will come a time for this law to be enforced when the people will be forced to obey at the cost of their lives. But before that is to happen, the law will be passed, will be introduced with all its good-looking reasons and splendor and purposes and motives and causes. But here we will see that in their clever attempt to introduce the Sunday law with an excuse of trying to save the world from its decaying state is a very typical device of Satan in order to deceive the people. And like in the title, so will we be tackling about how the Pope plans to save the world together with all the people in this world through the Sunday movement or the Sunday law. A rest day that they have said to be a rest we offer to nature as well. As we begin unfolding these great issues in our time, let us first and foremost ask the blessing of God in prayer to understand these heavenly things. Let us pray. Our Father in the midst of heaven, we thank thee for your great goodness to the people of this world, receiving your great grace and blessings in all forms to supply our need. In this quiet hour of study do we ask for the presence of God the Holy Spirit to endow our minds with spiritual understanding in order to grasp the meaning of the everlasting gospel and the prophecies that have everything to do with the soon coming crisis in this world. Only bless this channel as the means of spreading the truth to the people of this world and make us worthy both to receive and to preach these words coming from your divine treasury. Forgive us, O Lord, for the sins that we have committed against thee in our words, thoughts, and acts, and in neglecting our opportunities to do that which is good and that which is right. And all these things we ask and hope to receive. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. As we begin this study, my brethren, let us read our first text here in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verse 25. It says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. A worldly policy will be enforced at the end of days in order to prescribe to the people a day of worship. And this day of worship is something that will unite all of the people of this world. We have understood, my brethren, in the previous episode that this union, a movement of peace that the whole world will sing in unison, is the essence of the peace that the world could give under the dominion of Satan, a false unity, a confederacy against God and his commandments to strip the truth away from the minds of the people and lead them to ruin. This is one of the most devious ways that the enemy has used in order to glue those who have apostatized from God into one big company who will submit to the power of the papacy. But there was added another detail of this peace, because it is not only peace that is to be advocated in the last day, but even of our safety or our security. We read the connecting verse in the writings of Apostle Paul here in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, where it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, my brethren, take notice of the two great propagandists at the end of times that will end up receiving the anger of God. The first one is peace, and that peace will be secured through a religious union, a harmony of all their differences. This religious union will mold the lifestyle of the people and unify them in doctrine. A false peace that will make it look like they have combined forces for good reason, accepting common points of doctrine and discarding those points that differ greatly from each other. The second part of the propaganda is safety. Now, safety. Looking at it immediately with our perspective, it would mean being safe from strife, war, and bloodshed. But there is another form of safety that the world wishes to achieve, and that is to save the world from its decaying state. The papacy is currently advocating the movement to save this world from climate change and from the results of whatever pollutions that have identified as contributors 
to the opening of the ozone layer. The encyclical of the current Pope advocates this. In the writings of Pope Francis advocating how we should save the world in his book called Laudato Si, is where we can find as well the subtle suggestion, then becoming a blatant command to worship on Sunday in order to save the earth, this mother earth, and the elements of nature as our sisters and brothers, as he has said. However, this advocacy, my brethren, is an advocacy that is going contrary to the words of God and the fate of this world. They preach that this world could be saved, and we do that in order to give a good inheritance for those who are to follow our generation. But this world, my brethren, is beyond redemption using the hands of man. The world is destined to rot and be destroyed because of the fact that sin has corrupted this world. Of this destiny, we read here in the book of Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5. It says, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Here is clearly declared the result of sin. For breaking the laws of God, the first leaf that fell broke the heart of our first parents. The greenery that they were made caretakers of, the beauty of the lilies and the flowers and the fields that cannot be compared with Solomon's garment was the home of Adam and Eve. This home began to rot at the time of sin. Our world right now, my brethren, lying in wickedness and sin is nothing at all better than what it was in the past. It is in its worst state, for this world is about to perish. The curtains of our probation are soon to shut, and time will be no more. What awaits this world is a renewal, a new heaven and a new earth untainted with sin to become the home of the faithful. However, in this attempt to save the world, that, that as they have said, is the same as a denial of the will of God for this world. The Pope has advocated the change of how we abuse nature and its inhabitants for our own advantage. That in changing these matters and becoming much more nature-friendly, we may one day save this world under his advocacy and his command. But there is no truth to that. Although dominion was given to humanity over all the creatures, but it was never given in our power or to our power to save this world. Although a true Christian will work to make use, meditate, and preserve nature, but it is not within the description of the people of God to become advocates of ecology to try to save this world with our own hands and not by the power of the will of God. What is instructed to the people of God is this. Let us read here in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 31. It says, And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. The only salvation that exists for this world, this earth that we live in, is by the hands of God. And we read that in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, where it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So long as sin exists in this world, the world will be cursed. The only redemption that this world awaits is through the power of God. That is why the state of this world has been clearly stated here in the book of Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn. And everyone that dwell therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Now, let us jump to the encyclical that shows the will of the man of sin for the end of days. In the writing of Pope Francis called Laudato Si, we read here of the suggestions of the Pope to make a change, to transform this world using the powers of the land to effect these changes. Let us digest this little by little, my brethren. Starting from paragraph 3 of this book, it says, More than 50 years ago, with the world teetering on the brink of nuclear crisis, Pope St. John XXIII wrote an encyclical which not only rejected war but offered a proposal for peace. He addressed his message, Passum in Terris, to the entire Catholic world and indeed to all men and women of goodwill. As we read these passages, we are made to understand, my brethren, that we are on the right track of interpreting the prophecies and its fulfillment. 
The Pope wills to advocate peace not only for the Catholics but for all of the people. That was John the 23rd. But Pope Francis adds to his own agenda as he continues in the book saying here in paragraph 5 saying, Every effort to protect and improve our world entails profound changes in lifestyles, models of production and consumption, and the established structure of power which today governs societies. A change is then introduced to us. A necessary change in order to set the world in its right order. This is what the man of sin has found necessary to be done. And not only was it the Pope, but even those outside of the Church have made their contributions to the Roman Catholic Church to unify in making this happen. Now it says here in paragraph 7, These statements of the Pope echo the reflections of numerous scientists, philosophers, theologians, and civic groups, all of which have enriched the Church's thinking on these questions. Outside the Catholic Church, other churches and Christian communities, and other religions as well, have expressed deep concern and offered valuable reflections on issues which all of us find disturbing. Among the list of those voices who have contributed to this issue and the change that is necessary to better this world and save it from its destiny of ruin was the ecumenical patriarchate. It explains here in paragraph 9, saying, At the same time, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew has drawn attention to the ethical and spiritual roots of environmental problems which require that we look for solutions not only in technology but in a change of humanity. He asks us to replace consumption with sacrifice, greed with generosity, wastefulness with a spirit of sharing, and ascetism which entails learning to give and not simply to give up. A change of humanity was necessary, according to their words. And it was not merely a change of our behaviors and habits to make ourselves more of eco-friendly people. But the ecumenical patriarch was insinuating more to it than just that. The root of the expression was for a change to happen. And this change is to disregard humanity's existing rights of freedom of religion in order to make a change that will be enforced universally. The propaganda in the last days is of peace and safety. And these two matters are the points that the man of sin plans to manipulate. We add here in paragraph 14 saying, The urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development, for we know that things can change. Stated simple and clear, the man of sin has primed our minds to prepare to unite with each other and to prepare for a change that is to happen. Not merely a change in nature or a change of circumstance brought about by doing good things to nature and society, but rather a blatant change that will be enforced for the whole world to keep. This is how safety was to be advocated. A safety from destruction. An assumption that in this world that God has declared to be bound to ruin is a world that humanity can save. And that is something, my brethren, that we know only Satan alone would plant in the minds of the people in order to erase from the minds of the people their faith in the words of God. Now, we read that here in the book of Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10 and 22. It says, Because, even because, they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others stopped it with untempered mortar. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way, by promising him life. And we add here in the book of Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 4 and 11, it says, How long shall the land mourn, and the herbs of every field wither? For the wickedness of them that dwell therein, the beasts are consumed, and the birds, because they said, He shall not see our last end. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate, because no man layeth it to heart. This is the proclamation of those who are unbelieving to God. They will exist in this world, assuming that they will last a long time, and that even this world is something that will exist for a long time, even for eternity. So long that they have formulated plans to renew this world the longer that it gets. Believing that this world is evolving, my brethren. That is the most false conception of the world. This world coming from the Stone Age, the evolutionary period until we have reached this time, is a world that is constantly progressing. That is what they teach. 
The Pope has spoken of that assumption, and that is even the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. In paragraph 18 it says, The continued acceleration of changes affecting humanity and the planet is coupled today with a more intensified pace of life and work which might be called rapidification. Although change is part of the working of complex systems, the speed with which human activity has developed contrasts with the naturally slow pace of biological evolution. My brethren, this is something that we must address clearly. Evolution is unbiblical. To think that the world is a world that is constantly evolving is a great blasphemy against our God, a great rejection and a form of apostasy from our God, refusing to believe as what the Holy Bible has spoken. Man was made in its greatest capability, strength, talent, life, force, and glory at the beginning of this world. Time passed. And humanity has degraded in stature, intellect, and ability, and in moral powers because of sin. The way that this world works is that from its prime, from the time that it was made perfect, it was slowly and slowly rotting down. Our time is not the time of the greatest intellect, my brethren. Make no mistake. None of us existing in our time is intelligent enough to compare to those who have existed first in this world. We are only reaping the wisdom that has been established during their times. These airplanes and cars and technology are but an unfortunate result of the loss of the life force, the stature, and the strength of the people of this world. Why? Do you think that because people were walking in the past that they were dumb compared to us? You are the dumb one, my brethren, to believe that. Do you think that walking in staffs make them primitive and are inferior to our wisdom? That is where you are wrong. All of these inventions in our time are a result of the lack of life force, a lack of capability, a lack of capacity to perform daily tasks without the need for any instrument to aid us greatly. We are merely making high-tech wheelchairs and transportation because we have no life force, no strength to walk those miles as they were capable of walking before. We are a rotting generation, my brethren, a generation of degeneration. And that is something that we must be mature to accept. You and I are weak and frail and incapable. We are a degraded version of humanity, my brethren. This is our share of our groaning. However, the Roman Catholic Church in all their blasphemies just keep adding to their lies that even this world, starting with a bang, then came to a process of evolution. That is why the accounts of Noah, and the book of Genesis are but mere stories to them, and no longer the fundamental doctrine and the truth that the Catholics uphold. They were not reality to them. For the man of sin has spoken so. Let us read in the same book, in paragraph 70, saying, We see this in the story of Noah, where God threatens to do away with humanity because of its constant failure to fulfill the requirement of justice and peace. I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. These ancient stories, full of symbolism, bear witness to a conviction which we today share that everything is interconnected and that genuine care for our own lives and our relationships with nature is inseparable from fraternity, justice, and faithfulness to others. Nothing in the book of Genesis, especially in the accounts of the creation, even until the time of Noah, was symbolic. It was a narration of the beginning of this world and the beginnings of our patriarchs. What we could read is what happened. That is something that is supposed to stand as a substance of our foundation, but the Roman Catholic Church is crazy enough to declare that the very first books of the Bible is but a mere symbolism. We can add of other books to prove this point more and more and nail it to the ground that the Catholics believe it as their doctrine, but even those words coming from the Pope himself, the man of sin, are enough to understand that they are preaching a delusion to the people. It's your choice now, my brethren, to continue in a church who preaches that we came from monkeys and a big bang out of nowhere, or to believe in a God of creation. Now, we continue with the presentation. The Pope did not end with just giving us reasons to believe that this world can be saved and we can do something about it with our own power. The man of sin stepped further to declare that this will one day become a law for the whole world to obey. We read in paragraph 15, saying, In light of this reflection, I will advance some broader proposals for dialogue and action which would involve each of us as individuals and also affect international policy. Now, 
This is where they begin to explain how they are to do it. We read in paragraph 64, it says, I would like from the outset to show how faith convictions can offer Christians and some other believers as well ample motivation to care for nature and for the most vulnerable of their brothers and sisters. If the simple fact of being human moves people to care for the environment of which they are a part, Christians in their turn realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and the Creator are an essential part of their faith. This is the first thing that the man of sin implants in the mind. We have a responsibility within creation and a duty to our Creator, and that this is an essential part of your faith and my faith. Now, our duty to our Creator was clearly written in the Bible, and that is to worship on the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, God showing Himself as the Creator of this world. The seventh day Sabbath or Saturday, that fact was presented as well by the man of sin as he speaks here in paragraph 71. It says, Through Noah, who remained innocent and just, God decided to open a path of salvation. In this way, he gave humanity the chance of a new beginning. All it takes is one good person to restore hope. The biblical tradition clearly shows that this renewal entails recovering and respecting the rhythms inscribed in nature by the hand of the Creator. We see this, for example, in the law of the Sabbath. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. He commanded Israel to set aside each seventh day as a day of rest, a Sabbath. The Pope connects the importance of our responsibility to our Creator to the day of worship, and that is something that we have studied in the past. However, the change here is presented, and an obvious one at that, because after telling us that it is a part of our responsibility to nature to keep a day holy and rest on that day so that nature could as well rest, then they immediately introduced, after saying that we need to rest, the false day of rest, the spurious Sabbath, the requirement for saving the world one day. Now, we need to rest on Sunday to save this world, to put it shortly. That is what it says. The man of sin has spoken of that here in paragraph 237, saying, On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist, sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. This is what the papacy is to educate the people to believe and practice, starting from the Catholics and to the rest of the world through the ecumenical movement. However, the man of sin has stated his dissatisfaction with just making it an education. It must become a law. And once it becomes a law, he knows that the people will not be motivated to obey the law unless there is a reward, an incentive, or especially in this case, my brethren, a death threat, according to prophecy. We read of the words of the Pope here in paragraph 211, saying, Yet this education, aimed at creating an ecological citizenship, is at times limited to providing information and fails to instill good habits. The existence of laws and regulations is insufficient in the long run to curb bad conduct, even when effective means of enforcement are present. If the laws are to bring about significant, long-lasting effects, the majority of the members of society must be adequately motivated to accept them and personally transformed to respond. That motivation to make the world obey this day of rest and this day of worship is what we can read in the prophecy in the book of Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 back to 15. It says, And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed under the excuse of protecting the world, and even to keep this world safe, as safety will be a propaganda in the last days of this world, the Roman Catholic Church will then finally make use of this opportunity and excuse this alibi to establish the false Sabbath as the day of worship for the people to obey universally, under the motivation 
of being killed if you don't. The man of sin has declared itself as the one to wave the banner of the propaganda not only of peace, but also of safety. We read that in paragraph 79, where it says, The work of the church seeks not only to remind everyone of the duty to care for nature, but at the same time, she must, above all, protect mankind from self-destruction. Now, on September 2020, efforts were made by the Pope to let the world understand that it is now high time to act in order to save the world. In the article of the Associated Press, this is what has been reported of the words and intentions of the Pope. Now, it says here, The COVID-19 pandemic has shown how the earth can recover if we allow it to rest and must spur people to adopt simpler lifestyles to help a planet groaning under the constant demand for economic growth, Pope Francis said Tuesday. In his latest urgent appeal to help a fragile environment, Francis also renewed his call for the cancellation of the debts of the most vulnerable countries. Such action would be just, he said, since rich countries have exploited poor nations' natural resources. Here we notice that the words of the Pope is made to sway the world and control it by his words. For it was a universal advice that he gave to cancel all the debts of the poor nations of this world. This is an evident show of the power of the papacy still bearing sway in our most present time right now. The article continues, In some ways, the current pandemic has led us to rediscover simpler and sustainable lifestyles, Francis said in a written message. Already, we can see how the earth can recover if we allow it to rest. The air becomes cleaner, the waters clearer, and animals have returned to many places from where they have previously disappeared, he wrote. The pandemic has brought us to a crossroads. And that crossroad, my brethren, is a crossroad leading to the ruin of many of those who will keep the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment, for it is an excuse they have made that in order to save this world, we must bring a law to change and motivate the people even at the expense of a few righteous men who keep the laws of God. For the last document that we will be reading, my brethren, we rehearse the plan of the papacy in bringing this mark of the beast to the foreheads and hands of the people of this world. We cite of the book of the Pope, Dias Domini, page 7576. In this encyclical, he declares, Therefore also, in the particular circumstances of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. In any case, they are obliged in conscience to arrange their Sunday rest in a way which allows them to take part in the Eucharist, refraining from work and activities which are incompatible with the sanctification of the Lord's day, with its characteristic joy and necessary rest for spirit and body. My brethren, we rest these points of evidences to the fulfillment of the prophecies to your minds. And we implore that you make a fitting decision to remove ourselves from these churches and these teachings and come back to the old paths that God has proclaimed to be the way to salvation. As we end this presentation, let us bow our hands in solemn prayer. Let us pray. Our Father amid the high and lofty heavens, we come before Thee in the solemn hour of contemplation to thank Thee for Your words of great bearing upon our lives. As the papacy plans to save this world by enforcing the law that bears the mark of the devil's authority, we only ask that You would give us grace and great power to overcome all that we have grown into, especially on the point of Sunday worship, so that we may be able to return to the foundation of many generations and keep the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment, deserving to be called the people of Your covenant. Please forgive us for the sins that we have done against Thee in our words, thoughts, and deeds, as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Continuously lead the souls to a right understanding of Your words, even through this channel, so that the true everlasting gospel may spread far and wide to the souls that need Your saving grace. All these things we ask and hope to receive. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Amen. My brethren, we thank you for watching this episode of the Image of the Beast series. And like as always, my brethren, God is calling for His people who love Him and will show this love to Him by the obedience of His commandments, separation from the ecumenical movement, our preparation for the upcoming crisis in this world, especially on the point of the counterfeit Sabbath or the Sunday worship to be made as a law to be regulated to the whole world at the cost of our lives if we do not follow. God is calling you out of these false doctrines and to give evidence to our love and faith to Him through our words and actions and decisions that will choose to do that which is right in His sight. And if you feel the need to know more, feel free to contact us through the platform we have presented in our screen 
Make sure to like, share, subscribe. And if you have any questions, make sure to comment down below, make your reaction, inquire and search out the truth with us so that we may be able to read your comments and respond faithfully the words of God that you need. And like as always, my brethren, may God's blessing be upon you.